Good morning again, uh, Pastor Denson. Welcome by Faith Community Church. Uh, certainly glad to see everybody and uh, thankful that you are alive, that you're well, that you are resting in the sweet uh, governing bosom of our God. Father, it's again that we come this morning uh, via live stream. It's again, Lord, that we look to the hills from which cometh our help. And it's again, Lord, that we know all of our help comes from you. Our hearts, Lord, are overjoyed this morning that we again got another brand new present called today, uh, the 5th of April. And we're thankful, Lord, that there were no limits on any good thing in this day, that you have held no good thing back from us. And Father God, your grace is sufficient to meet our every need in this day. So much so, Lord, that the prayers that we've sent up, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Lord, you have fed us. You have clothed us. You have brought us. And now, Lord, you present us today faultless before the presence of your glory. Cause us to decrease now, Lord, that you and your Holy Spirit within us may increase. And Father God, that your will be done. Give me, Lord, that anointing that will make preaching easy this morning. The subject that you've laid on my heart, Lord, is one that I continue to grow. I continue to seek to get better. And I continue to honor you in all that we do and all that we say. Have your way with Walking by Faith Community Church and all of those who are listening around the world. Have your way with us all. Cause your will to be done in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, good morning to you, and I am thankful. Uh, I want to take a moment this morning and 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 speak on something that has become, again, a part of my week. Every message that we get during this season is, I believe, ordered by the Lord and this message this week gives us not so much of a focus on what's going on in the world, but what should be going on inside of us. The message this morning is entitled, Jesus Christ, the perfect example of obedience. Jesus Christ, the perfect example of obedience. Scripturally, we're going to be all over the Bible. We're going to base our scripture reading this morning out of the book of John, uh, the 14th chapter. I would like to read for you just a few verses uh, from John, the 14th chapter, as we take a look, a journey, in following the perfect example of obedience led by Jesus Christ. In the 15th, in the 14th chapter of this particular book of the Gospel of John, uh, beginning with verse number one, I just want to read a little bit this morning, uh, 14 and one, God gives us these words, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and ye know the way. Thomas says unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goeth, and how can we know the way? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. And Philip says unto the Lord, show us the Father and it suffice us. And Jesus says unto him, have I been so long with you, and yet have thou not known me, Philip? He that have seen me has seen the Father. 
And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye ask in my name that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, verse number 15, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you. Thank you for the reading of God's holy word. I wanted to read that uh, just to kind of get your mind in sync with what Jesus is really come to do. Jesus has a very interesting job. And it's a job that nobody else could do nor probably want to do. A lot of them want to steal the glory of Jesus in terms of having you or I think that they are our savior, the truth of the matter is nobody can make the claim that Jesus through God has made and nobody has done what Jesus through God has done. And therefore, no one should have an opportunity on your, my behalf, to take that position that Jesus rightfully deserves. Jesus says he purchased us with his blood. And because now we are purchased commodity and we belong to him, it's really incumbent upon us to develop the right relationship that God desired when he sent Jesus to us for us. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that relationship and why it's so important that we not take it so lightly. I want to talk about obedience first. And obedience simply says, in definition, that it is the compliance with an order, a request, or law, or submission to another's authority. The word obedience itself carries an underlining tone, if you will, of reverence, an act of obeying, very similar to that of a subordinate soldier obeying the officers that are ranked over him. In the New Testament, we have a word that we use that's called pieto, which means obedience, to yield to or to trust in or believe in. And that is the same attribute that Jesus brings in chapter 14 and throughout the Gospel of John. Yet though, so that we can obey God through Jesus, trust in him and believe in him. The question I have for you this morning is, who are you obedient to? Don't be so quick to think I'm going to run on. I want you to pause and think about that for a second. Indeed, are you obedient to anyone? First and foremost, when we consider the word obedience, we think about a duty or a chore or something that has to be completed, probably something with a standard and that standard has, in most cases, a certain time limit to accomplish it, a beginning and an end, so you don't have forever to leave it idly weighing by the wayside. 
does it prompt you or me when we hear that word to get in a line to be obedient? I think not. I think obedience is that type of word that, that most of us don't want to become obedient because we like our will. We prefer our will. And I understand I'm talking to believers this morning as well as maybe even some unbelievers. But the truth of the matter is, when we think about our relationship with God, it's predicated, it's based, it's built on this word obedience. I know oftentimes we look at a lot of other things that God stands for. He's love, he's wisdom, he's understanding, he's our protection. But the truth of the matter is, the New Testament is really geared and based in one principal word, and that's obedience. The Bible says to us, if you love me, keep my commandments. What it's really saying is, if you love me, God says to us, if you love me, be obedient to me. Payeto, believe in me, trust in me and be obedient. In other words, submit to me, follow my request, carry out my orders. It goes on to say, even from a young age, we are taught in the way of obedience. We're taught to learn how to obey. And even from the beginning of our journey, that's something that we never really truly perfect. From the time of our birth to the time of our grave, we fail to perfect obedience. How do I know that? Because I've stood by many of bedsides, I've been in many hospitals, I've been in many sick rooms, and I've seen the disposition of those who were crossing over from this life to the next. And for the most part, most of them just wanted to make sure that Jesus was going to meet them. God says it this way, if you love me, and we understand love, we understand giving ourselves for someone. But if you love me, you'll be obedient to me. And there will be no reason to wonder or to question whether or not Jesus will receive you unto himself. John says we look through a glass darkly. But in that day, when we see Jesus for ourselves, that we shall see him and we shall be like him. All of us want that. We want to be like him and we want to spend eternity with him. But we cannot do that except we go through the basic tenets of what God sent his son for. Let's take a look. Because even before we begin to think about our birth, before we begin to think about our childhood, even into our adulthood, man had this very plight from the book of Genesis. And from the book of Genesis, it reads, you know what? God says, let's make man. After he had did all of the creation of everything that would support man, God says, let's make man. And in doing so, in verse number 16, God began to, and this is Genesis chapter one, amen, excuse me, chapter two, uh, verse number 16. And God gave him this command that you may eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat of the tree that gives knowledge about good and evil. If you eat fruit from that tree on that day, you shall certainly die. For you and me, reading this, that's pretty cut and dry, isn't it? Now, who can mess that up? You know we did, don't you? Adam messed that up. 
And the truth of the matter is, you might say, man, how could he? And then somebody might say this, well, if he had told them about the enemy, then maybe he would have been aware and maybe he wouldn't have eaten of that tree. Hmm. Makes you think, doesn't it? I stopped by today to tell you, even after Adam did what he did, God took a special care in letting us know about the enemy. Are we still failing? Are we still disobedient? We know about the enemy. I don't think it's an excuse. Truth of the matter is, no matter how we look at it, God wants obedience. His statement was the day that you become obedient in relations to that tree of knowledge of good and evil, the day that you partake of it, the sentence is you shall surely die. God is serious about obedience. And I know we are all having our own fights and challenges with obedience. But herein is where the story really gets interesting and important that God loved obedience so much that he had a plan for when we failed. And the plan is and was that he would send his only begotten son. He would send him to save us from our failure of the one thing that was not like him, the like of obedience, the lack of order. God is a God of order and he wants us to be within his order. He goes on to say, he gave us a kingdom to rule over. Earth, it was ours. And the one thing that he told us not to do while we ruled over that kingdom, Adam named everything. He, he, he put everything in its perspective, in its place, in its order. And Adam gave it all up because of disobedience. Can you see the power that contrasts God's ultimate power of obedience? Obedience takes us from where God really wants us to be eternally with him, and it puts us in a state of damnation. And I'm not preaching hell and damnation this morning. I'm preaching I need us as believers to understand that obedience is not an option. Obedience is a requirement of God, and it demands our immediate attention. He goes on to say, that his plan for us didn't go the way it should have. So God says, I'm gonna show him how it's done. And he did so by starting our example of perfect obedience. He says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. I've always thought about that word love and why, as we read through the whole first four or three chapters or books of the New Testament, love was one of the words that wasn't used a lot. But when we get to John, the word love is used, I mean, countless times, repeated, repeatedly over and over and over again. But in this third the 16th verse says, God so loved the world, his creation. He sent or he gave his only begotten son. What is this love? What is this love? Is it the love that you and I, I know we talk about Philia, Philio and, and all of these different types of love. But the truth of the matter is, what is love and why was love used in that verse that God so loved the world? Because God wanted to show us exactly what our relationship 
was supposed to look like with him. And he did it through Jesus himself. He so loved. In other words, he loved us. He wanted us to be like him. He created us in his likeness and in his image so that we would become love. And love simply means, just as it did in John 14, if you love me, you would be obedient to me. God says he is love. In other words, God says, I am order. I am obedient. God word, God's word has power and authority. Therefore, when he spoke his word, it did what he, uh, he designed it to do. And his word was made flesh for you and me so that we too would be able to return or reciprocate that love back to the Father. It's interesting. It's interesting for me that he so loved the world that not only did he do that, but he put his son, who is the example, and he says, here is the assignment. You remember we talked about that chore, that duty, that whole will of man, as the preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes says, that the whole duty of man, amen, is to love God with all of his mind, and all of his heart and all of his soul to be obedient to God. God wants a creation that would honor him. And in return, his love, not our love to get his love, but his love would be made preeminent in us. So let's take a look at this. Jesus' first step of obedience was that he left heaven. His heavenly throne, watch this, and we say this oftentimes, but I don't know if we understand the gravity of it. He left heaven and came through 42 generations, 42 generations. In other words, in other words, as we get to John and we understand what's being said, 42 generations, there were those who came before him. That was supposed to teach us and, and to show us what this example of obedience was to look like. And we had some greats. We had Abraham. We had Noah. We had, we had some greats. We had Elijah. We had Moses. We had all of those. But none of them could be obedient until the end. came down through 42 generations, came after a forerunner by the name of John. But even in all of that, Jesus knew, listen to what I'm saying, Jesus knew because of his love, his obedience to the Father, that he was first, but he accepted the last position. What do I mean by that? Came down through 42 generations, the entire Old Testament into the New Testament. Jesus allowed all of those to include John to be before him and watch this, fulfilling the scripture of Matthew 20 and 16, where he says that the first, or should I say it this way, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Jesus knew he was first. But he came last. And what do I mean by last? There is not another who can come after him to do what he did. And therefore, he is placed first. I know a lot of times we think about that and we put ourselves in the position that says, you know what, I'm going to be last so I can be first. But really, when you really look at it, Jesus made himself of no reputation. He was first, but gave up his first position to take in the last position to save us and to secure us. And it says on this wise, in Isaiah 6 and 8, as he made this claim, as he came down through these 42 generations, whom shall I send and who will go? And Isaiah said, I'll go. But Isaiah wasn't going to be good enough. 
So Jesus became this perfect guiding light that we as mankind need to learn and to understand the way of obedience from. Many came before him, many came after him, as I said, but there is not one who can get between him and us now and block our path that Jesus laid for us. Paul says it like this, what shall we say then after Jesus came? What shall we say then? If God be for us, if God sent his only begotten son as the, as the example for us to get back to him, who can be against us? It's not the trial or the tribulation so much so. He goes on to say that in the 28th, uh, in the eighth chapter of Romans, none of that stuff shall be able to separate us. But the emphasis here in this particular verse, number 32, he says to us that he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. And how shall he not freely give us all things? Jesus came down through those 42 generations. Jesus accepted the fact that he would not have a place to lay his head. Jesus accepted the fact that while he was on earth, he would never have a humble abode. He accepted the fact that many would come and say things contradictory to who he is. And even while here, they sought to kill him, but nothing can undo the work that he did for you and I. As God seeks our love, our obedience to show the true relationship that he had for Adam in the garden that he still has for us today. John 1 and 1 says this. He says, before the world began, he says the word was with God and the word was God. He says the word was with God in the beginning and everything that was made through him, nothing was made without him. In him, there was life. And that life was the light for the people of the world. It's the light of men. What was the light? What was the light? The light was the obedience or the pathway that led to the love of God to lead us back home to a heavenly father. He became the light of men. And the one thing he constantly laid before you and me in the book of John is that he loved his father. And because he loved his father, he would be obedient to him. Matter of fact, he says, it's not me that doeth the work, but it's my father in me that doeth the work. He says, the works that you see me do, that even you can do them if you have the same relationship, the relationship of obedience that leads to loving God with your whole mind, with your whole body, and with your whole soul. Jesus came and demonstrated this very point to us. And this is the point that he demonstrated. He demonstrated obedience by saying, I'm doing it my father's way. Watch this. Not only my father's way, but in the way that he said do it. And not only as long as it's convenient for me, but all the way until it's done like my father predestined it to be. Jesus took no shortcut. There's not a man alive or ever was alive that can say he didn't take a shortcut. Even Elijah. Elijah desired and ended up being taken. But even Elijah nor Enoch could have what Jesus has. A sinless nature. And I stopped by today to tell you that We've got to get to a point in this current day that we live in, regardless of COVID, regardless of what the president or any other authority says, 
regardless of what our family is demanding of us, regardless of what the job, regardless of what our situations, our current disposition, regardless of all of that, we've got to get to a point where we understand that God requires obedience. I get it in the sense that God says, why is the way that leadeth to destruction? Because a lot of people are not thinking about the obedience. They're just thinking about pleasing what they think to be their God. But there's only one way to please God. I know we say that without faith, it's impossible. But when you take faith, if you take faith and you look at it, faith is saying that I believe everything that God through Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit has ever said. Nothing can compare. Nothing is equal. It's for God through Jesus his Holy Spirit, that I live and that I'll die. <laughs> if we don't get to that level of obedience, ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, we're still on that road that's wide, that leadeth to destruction. There's no halfway. Yeah, God knows your heart, but he also knows what his command is. If you love me, these are not requests. If you love me, you'll be obedient to me. You got to stop thinking that you have an option. You got to stop thinking that tomorrow I'll repent. You got to stop thinking that I'll have a chance to make it right. God says, no man knoweth the hour. The day know the hour that the son of man will appear. Let me give it to you in a more direct way that, listen, it's appointed to every man wants to die. And unfortunately, you don't know and I don't know when that is. And we cannot afford to be riddled and quicksand in sin. Every living moment of our life, we cannot be like Christ, but we can strive to have the relationship that Christ had with his father. We can strive to do the right thing in the order that God said it to be done. How do we know that? Because Jesus came as the word. And if you've seen the word, if you've seen the word, you've seen Jesus. And Jesus says, I and the Father are one. If you don't spend any time in the word, then you won't know what Jesus looks like. Therefore, you won't know who God looks like. And the truth is, if you don't know those key components, then how can your relationship be what God calls it to be? We've got to make up our mind. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Don't be troubled about what's going on today. Let not your heart be troubled about anything. Jesus says, if you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. We are not living this life here so that we can amass our riches. God says, if you set your affections on the things of the world, that's where your heart will be. That's where your love will be. But if you set your affections on the things of heaven, in other words, there's some folk in the wrong position in our lives. There's some folk who got too much power over us. Leave alone the adversary. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy you. But I'm talking about the people that Satan, as crafty as he is, has kind of etched this way in there and made you look at somebody else as if though they can separate you from the love of God. I stopped by today to tell you that Jesus made this very clear. Jesus said very simply that if you love me, then the Father would love you. That if you would believe in the promise that he made, that I came 
Jesus. And I gave my life so that mankind could be saved. I came and I dwelt under man, but in the midst of man, but the man's ways are evil and he loves darkness. The world was made, formed and shaped by him. Let us make man in our image, but man rejected him. Lastly, I wanna share this thought with you. We have to really get our mind together because if we think for one remote second that I did enough good and I'll make it in, think about Isaiah 53. When God allowed his only begotten son to be wounded for our transgressions, to be bruised for our iniquities. When God allowed the love of his life and there is no end or beginning to God to be crushed so that he could be obedient and fulfill God's plan. When God allowed him to be beaten, smitten, stricken, when God allowed the sins of humanity to wrap itself around his only begotten son. And the scripture says, and he turned his back, not because of his son that he loved, but because of the sinful nature that he wore. Don't you think for one second that God is gonna accept your or my sins? He's going to turn his back on us too, except we accept his plan of redemption. Jesus says in chapter 15 of John, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the light. He that believeth in me, yet though he were dead, yet shall he live. Accept God's plan. His plan of redemption is a plan of obedience. It's a plan of order. It's a plan of love. And that plan was sent to be the perfect example that leads us from earth to heaven to spend eternity with God, the Father. Trust him. Trust him and never doubt. And I promise, according to the word of God, that through Jesus Christ, he will deliver us all out into glory to spend eternity with him forever. May God bless you. May God keep you. May he honor you because of your obedience in Jesus' name. Father, I love you and I thank you again for the opportunity just to speak on your word of obedience. And now, Lord, each of us, I know we're wrestling within our own selves about the obedience or the lack thereof that we are displaying while we say we love you. Cause us to search our hearts. Cause us to know without a question, Lord, that we love you. And in doing so, Lord, we become obedient. We become submissive. We become yours, just as you were in Christ. Be also in us and lead us down the plain path that lead it to life everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen.